Great. All right. Good. I think you guys see the screen. Everything looks good. It does. Perfect. Today I'm going to be in the, in the mountains. Give everyone one more minute to get to hop in, and then we'll get started. Great. Okay, let's get started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining the uh, the Western Canada uh, RPA user group um, session. Uh, today's session is a an exceptional smart individual named uh, Yanka and uh, from ATB. I'm super excited to have her uh, on uh, to share her story from ATB. She's been with ATB for uh, five years. Um, she's currently the, uh, the managing director of intelligent automation. Um, and has done a ton of really exciting uh, automation work to help with uh, ATB's uh, COVID relief, uh, account <coughs> searching, uh, lending, and, uh, and yeah, she certainly did work uh, for 10 years with uh, Canadian Pacific, um, doing a whole bunch of capacity planning. Um, a couple other neat facts, uh, she's a, a black belt, so you got to watch out, uh, and, but in lean. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, um, so yeah. Uh, with that said, I'll uh, I'll pass the torch over to Yanka. Thanks, Jesse, and thank you everybody for having me here today. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So, you know, I mean, my name is Yanka Coppins, and as Jesse said, I'm managing director of intelligent automation at ATB. I'm going to pull up a slide deck here as I chat, and hopefully, it shares okay. Just give me one sec here. Yeah, and let me know we're good to go. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So today I will share with you some of the progress that we've made at ATB using um, intelligent automation and some of the capabilities that we've built up over the years and the impact this is having on our clients today. So I'll talk about how we've evolved over the years and some of the key decisions that we've made, um, some of the challenges and opportunities we faced along the way, and what we're looking at next. So uh, what are some of the next steps we're looking at, some of the technology we're looking at, and all that good stuff. So I'll start with a little bit about myself. So Jesse pretty much already mentioned my bio. Um, so my background is heavily comprised of process improvement. So I would consider that probably my core competency. Yeah, I mean, like most of us on this call, I've had various leadership and personality assessments over the years. And you know, I mean, my interpretation of these is they kind of come back the same. I'm, I'm passionate, logical, purposeful, adaptable. Time is of the essence to me. Um, if you ask my husband, he'll probably say something differently, probably something along the lines of impatience, impatient and exhausting. So while these traits might not have helped me with cooking over the years, uh, they definitely do seem to be a good fit for my current role. 
So, you know, I mean, they translate into yeah. a career I just, <laughs> to a career I just yeah. love um, where change is abundant. And, you know, I mean, I get to work with amazing people and an amazing team. So a little bit about ATB. ATB is a crown corporation. Uh, we provide financial services to over 773,000 clients. My role and the intelligent automation team uh, reside within the technology group. You know, I mean, we're all about creating value for our clients and driving financial returns through productivity improvements. And we do this by automating non-value added activities, which frees up capacity for our team members to do more complex, more, uh, more interesting work. And we're about enabling a consistent uh, and reliable customer experience for our clients. So a little bit about where uh, we are today with intelligent automation. So we started as a small team working with strictly RPA technology and we've evolved to a very large team that implements end-to-end -end process transformation by integrating RPA as well as other adjacent technologies. And I mean, we, we use AI for vision, language, execution, and learning capabilities today. We, we integrate API, so application program interfaces uh, for stable connections, natural language processing for data capture and talking to our robots. Um, so yeah, so we're doing a lot of interesting things. The core team consists of a leadership team, an operational support team and delivery squads uh, made up of cross-functional individuals. You know, I mean, we have developers, we have technical product leads. We, uh, we work with various partners in the organization for um, various support functions as well. So UX design, product management, um, many to tell you the truth. So these are some of our results uh, to date. Um, everyone always talks about efficiency and they always ask about efficiency. Uh, I would say efficiency is probably the easiest result to capture and a lot of times what organizations are looking for for uh, return on investment. So, you know, I mean, in terms of efficiency between 2017 and today, we, we freed up over 320,000 th 320, hours of effort, um, which, you know, I mean, we're obviously pretty excited about. But for us, it was always more about the customer experience. So, you know, I mean, it's about providing that efficient, consistent customer experience by reducing cycle times, improving quality input along the way, reducing rework. Um, and it's also been about really increasing capacity for our team members so they can really focus on advice for our clients and really focus on where the, the value is. I'll talk a little bit about our journey and, you know, I mean, I'm talking a lot here, so I would say if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I'm happy to stop and address as they pop up. But this depicts our journey over the last few years. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, and I'm not going to talk to every point either. But I would say it's probably some of the key activities that are top of mind for us. So, like most organizations at the beginning, we started with a proof of concept, and and for us when we started. It was really about the customer experience. So we found our team members did their best to provide great experiences despite the processes we had at ATB. We had a lot of disconnected systems, a lot of information flowing from a lot of different places, um, a lot of copy and paste. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of organizations are probably facing the same thing. So for us, it was about leveraging RPA as a means to differentiate a customer experience and make life easier for our team members. So we started with a POC, you know what I mean? Um, like other organizations, we had various partners along the way to help us get started. Um, so we brought in a partner to help. Uh, first, it was about automating a process and seeing what the technology can do, what we can learn from it. You know, I mean, one of the things we learned right off the get-go that we're an SAP, uh, we're an SAP user and uh, our SAP was um, too slow for the bots, right? So you learn something day one. Did I? Hey, I'll know, we, uh, we lost audio on you uh, for a minute. And over the next few oh. months, seconded some team members. 
Oh, sorry, am I hearing anything? Uh, we lost you for a minute, but you're back. So welcome back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please continue. And, yeah, okay, I'll, uh, I'll get to you. So um, over the next uh, few months, we seconded some team members, engaged a partner, and started training up some of our own people to do the development work and focused on back-end operations. Um, and it was an interesting time. We, we learned a lot during this time. So I would say some of the things that, some of the benefits that we had, we, we were finding we were able to differentiate a customer experience. We, we were able to automate about 25 processes within, you know, I mean, about a year. And we had big learnings about what the technology could do, um, what it couldn't do and how to leverage it better and how we can augment it. Uh, we also saw a lot of opportunities after the first few months. So at this point, I'm talking about probably a team of six internal people um, combined with um, an external group of, let's say, another four or five. And, you know, some of the things I would say we've learned is that it's not a silver bullet. It, it, you need to apply it fit for purpose. We, we had a lot higher accept, exceptions rate than we expected. And a lot of this had to do with either we weren't using the technology on the right processes, or we just didn't have the standard uh, data inputs that we needed uh, to make it successful. We were disappointed with our velocity of builds. And I guess disappointed is the wrong word, but you know, I mean, we, we just saw an opportunity to increase the speed there in terms of how quickly we could develop. And we're finding limitations with um, localized auto automation. So we're automating first, like for like. So we're finding that, you know, I mean, you don't necessarily want to make a bad process work faster or be automated. Um, and it, we're really, really limited in that capacity. Um, and then the other piece is because we are a regional bank, we wouldn't have the scalability that an uh, international bank would have. So we weren't seeing the benefit realizations and the returns and the scalability of doing those quick hits that maybe other organizations would. So we really realized we had to um, change our approach. And the other piece was too, in terms of how we were identifying our opportunities. Uh, we were getting business-led opportunities brought to us and some of those weren't a good fit for automation. Some of them were not the high value added opportunities, but I would say maybe the stuff that people don't want to do. So they wanted to get it off their desks. So in 2018, we really revised our approach. You know, I mean, we, we went to an enterprise prioritization model, which is taking a scientific approach to understand where we should focus our attention by prioritizing the 900 banking processes the bank does by a number of factors. And we took into account things like voice of the customer, team member effort, risk, ex risk exposure, and uh, numerous other things. Um, but what that gave that gave us is a real scientific view to where we, where we focus. We um, incorporated design thinking, lean management, product design management practice oh, at this yes. point to, <laughs> to really oh, redesign sure. the... Uh, <laughs> Is everyone hearing that? <laughs> yeah, for anyone who isn't muted, um, even if you're being quiet, we can still hear you. <laughs> it might be a good idea to make sure you're not speaking intentionally. Not just you, Yanka. I, I think I muted them. Yeah. Let's continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so we, uh, we really focused on an end to end transformational approach at this point in time. Um, we also started building, building our team at the time. So we were hiring quite a bit. We started going cross-functional. So adding in product management to support, we split out our operations capability from the delivering squad. Um, so again, a lot of activities happening here. And then we also started looking at a, augmenting with AI. And we really focused on a couple of pieces here. One would be a standardized data capture mechanism that can feed information to our bots. And the other piece would be starting to incorporate, and this was early stages, OCR and machine learning capabilities into some of our automations, um, particularly one to tell you the truth. So a lot of work done there. Um, what we found at this point is we, we were 60% faster 
in terms of delivery. And we had a huge jump in quality improvement. So it was a 20% um, improvement in quality. And, you know, I mean, a lot of reduced exceptions at this rate at, the, at this time. Some of our opportunities we found was uh, still a lot of opportunity to scale. So there's so much, uh, there's so many quick hits still in the organization available. And, you know, I mean, we were in the early days. We, we started worrying about our object quality and reuse. So you, you build up a team, everyone's um, jazzed and starts developing. And, you know, what I mean, you start kind of going in different directions and benefit realization. So it's one thing to be able to to get the automations and you know you're freeing up capacity but how do you ensure the business is acting on that capacity unless the business changes the way they work you're never going to realize some of those efforts so there was a real education piece and then the understanding that you know i mean leaders in the organization actually have to change the way they work and redesign their org structure a bit and you know i mean expectations of leaders managing a dual workforce when you have bots and humans working together. So I don't see any questions yet, so I'm gonna keep going here. So, you know, I mean, 2019 to scale a little faster, we started federating some of the pure RPA capability um, just to be able to do more. And uh, we introduced the design committee so the design committee was really about ensuring that we um, we are building in a manner that was supportable and resilient and we're adhering to technical standards. And we we're also trying a lot of new things at that point in time. So it's like, how do we best go about um, testing those? We uh, started integrating with ServiceNow uh, and that was for a couple of pieces. And that, one was to create tickets for our operations team. And for, yeah! Baby, that's what I've been waiting for. That's what it's all about. Huh. <laughs> okay, then. Bianca, I think I figured out how to mute everyone. Uh, let's let's continue. Yep. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I think I was muted there too for a minute. <laughs> um, okay, so ServiceNow integration and so for generating tickets for break fix and going to operations team, but also for sending out uh, exceptions to the back office. Uh, so that's actually how they handle their work now. And we've we did a lot of uh, stakeholder partnership and education at this point in time too, in terms of what RPA is about, um, when would we use API integration versus RPA integration and what kind of benefits we, uh, we should get. Yes, we did leverage the API for service now, if that's the question, for sure. Um, so uh, benefits here, again, improved velocity and better solution designs that were more consistent across the team. We, we still had obviously work to go in that space and it's always going to, be, going to be challenging, I would say, but we definitely addressed some of the gaps that we had. But as you change the way you work and you develop new standards, of course, you're starting to build up some technical debt. And I would say that that started uh, weigh, uh, weighing on us for sure. And a lot of quick wins started getting complete. You know what I mean? So those really quick turnaround automations. Um, and then the other piece was communication and communication within our team that was bigger, communication between us and some of the federated developers, uh, communication between us and the business. But we were finally attaining a velocity that the business was actually really happy with because they were actually pretty excited about the work that was being done. But now they were having trouble keeping up with all the work that was being done, all the releases that are being done. Um, and incorporating them into the way they work and communications within the team. So I would say probably good problems to be had, had at the time, but problems nevertheless, which takes us into the last couple of years. And, you know, I mean, I would say some of these activities are probably out of order, um, but I would say we really started increasing the complexity of our designs. So we're, we're getting more transformational, but the, I would say the easy work for the customer facing pro processes, a lot of it was done. ATB moved back to a centralized architectural um, system. 
So the good thing there is we actually got to work closer with architects and bring them into our solution design. And architecture, you know, I mean, often doesn't think highly of RPA because of the natural technical debt that you incur um, using that software. The beauty with working closely with architects is, you know, I mean, the, I think the benefits came across. They saw how quickly we were able to deliver value and we worked together to identify where and when to use it throughout the solution design. So I would say it's been a really good collaboration um, and we're actually getting a lot of support versus before, you know what I mean? I think we were kind of seen as, um, a group that would probably create more technical debt than that than that they would would like. Um, so yeah, so that was a good one. And then I'd say we really started working closer with our partner at this time too. So you know, I mean, our our vendor is Blue Prism for the software we use, and because of the complexity, because of the things we were trying to do, uh, we really started working closely with them. Our developers started um, speaking with um, their technical advisors quite frequently. You know, I mean, monthly cadences were set up. Um, just to kind of work through certain problems and ideas that we had. You know, I mean, we've met with various areas of, uh, of their team, including a lot of uh, conversations with innovation in terms of things we would like to see and that we're trying to do. And I think the really big win for 2020 was some of the COVID-19 work we did. Um, it hit the team hard in terms of a lot of work done in a short period of time. But I would say for, the, for ATB and for our customers, it was amazing to have a capability that we were able to spin up automation that quickly to address demand that we did not know was coming. I would say within a month, we handled 80,000 transactions uh, COVID related that were unexpected and those were automated. And that is, that is something that as a bank, we would not have been able to address that demand uh, by throwing people at it. It would have been, meant long queues and customers would have been waiting a long time for their money or for their requests to be done. So that, that was a really, um, I think that was a real gem for us that year. The, the struggle we had uh, that really started surfacing was capacity. So capacity for enhancements for one. So at this point in time, you know, I mean, we had well over a hundred processes in production, probably approaching two. And, you know, I mean, there were requests coming in to enhance. People had ideas on how these could run better or changes. Um, and we just didn't have capacity to address those. So quite honestly, I, I would say we weren't. So we, we wanted to tackle that. And that's been some of the activities last year. So, you know, I mean, we developed an enhancement steer coast so that we could actually work with our stakeholders to prioritize some of these, uh, some of the work that's been done quite a while ago and is no longer active um, and get some of their requests uh, requests in. Yes, I'll definitely speak to that, Jennifer. Um, and I'd say we have a pretty good cadence there now. So it took us a year to really get a smooth process for enhancement prioritization. And I would just say in the last couple of months, I feel like we're really starting to nail it and we've set aside capacity for it. Okay, so COVID transactions. So I, I will say one of the ones that, uh, the big one that was, uh, that was automated was SIBA. So it was the government program. Um, you know, I mean, we had a lot of uh, individuals apply for it. The really co cool thing about this one is it was our first end-to-end -end direct to customer lending automation. So basically, you know, I mean, we worked with another team that did a front customer user interface to submit the request. And then it went to the bot for fulfillment, um, which, you know, I mean, was beautiful. And the transaction volume was extremely high. And from what I'm hearing, we were basically the first bank to be able to automatically fulfill those uh, very quickly. Other banks had queues that were quite long. The, the other thing that we focused on was a lot of customers needed to change their loans to accommodate, um, you know, I mean, financial struggles, I would say. So if you think about loan deferrals, whether it's on the corporate or personal side, so be Sometimes it just takes a, little, a couple of minutes for things to buffer. Kind of brings me back to the old days of downloading MP3s. 
<laughs> Can you hear me okay, or did I cut out? Yeah, you're back, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, sorry about that. I don't know if I need to repeat or if that uh, we, we question was We last or... about 30 seconds, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think I ended with uh, loan deferrals were also automated, um, corporate and uh, personal. Yeah, I, let's see. I'm actually using a, a headset right now. That's okay. Yeah, let's continue. Okay, I'll continue. Um, I'll uh, talk to the question about adding design authority function. So that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, it's something that we're definitely focusing on right now. Let's see, I'm going to actually flip to the next slide in terms of some of our some of our focuses. So there, there's a few things that are, I would say, important to us right now. And one of them is scaling in a cost effective manner and being able to support an ever increasing amount of automations. So part of it is improved scheduling monitoring. So we want to do things like automated load leveling, proactive monitoring. Um, Introducing automated regression testing. Uh, we are seeing, you know, I mean, more work with testing and remediation as we start doing um, upgrades. We, we're migrating to cloud this year. You know, I mean, we may change licensing structure in the future because of that. There is a big opportunity in scaling the ability to pull information in from anywhere. So we want to scale like the computer vision and OCR capability through federation um, that takes some technical development work with one of our partners and then as ai capabilities continue to grow you know i mean they'll become better at supporting us so we're really looking into intelligent automation generated by intelligent automation so so that's got to do with things like automated process discovery um, self-configuration to reduce development time something we're not doing right now but i think there's going to be big potential in the next year and monitoring and maintenance of solutions. So self-healing, um, using AI to predict and identify and resolve causes of failure. Um, in terms of automated code reviews, lots of work to do there. You know, I mean, we do do our peer reviews. There's some scripting in there for sure, uh, but I do think uh, a lot more opportunity there. Okay, so a question here, how are we able to communicate maintenance requirements per automation to the business? Not sure if I can, I don't know if I understand that question, if I can get a little more context, either through typing or, you know, I mean, going off mute would also work. Ah, okay, not allowed to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I'll take a stab at it and then feel free to type it. Okay, perfect. I'll go back to it once you type it out. And let's see. Sorry, I'm reading questions here as I go. So, so yes, um, I'm looking at uh, David. Bernie's questions here, um, and he was one of our early partners, I'll say. Uh, in the early years of the program, there were clear automation opportunities. Five years in, are you finding opportunities that can still deliver significant value impact? The answer is yes. So our team uh, just went through an exercise of revamping our heat map for the organization. So I would say we have a pretty good indication of where all the opportunities are. To date, we've been focusing on customer facing um, opportunities. And I would say a lot of the quick hits there have dried up and we're doing a lot of the more complex things like end-to-end -end lending. Uh, but we have identified additional opportunities there, but there's a lot of internal processes that we have not addressed.
And let's see what else do we have here. Not sure if, okay, I'm gonna kind of flip through these here. So how do you monitor if there's any system issues with the bot? So we, we do have, we do have an operations team. We also have reporting in the control room. So anyone can actually pull up our report that shows what's in production and it shows you the, it shows you the performance of everything we have in production. Um, at a product family level down to a granular level. So you could see if over time you're starting to see more exceptions um, or, or if it's going up or down. We, we also have uh, a group of individuals monitoring our processes. Um, we have a RPA controller uh, on our team who does a great job monitoring and make sure everything's up and going. And the business also has some controllers monitoring on their end as well. So. So that's part of it. We do have uh, alerts built into the builds. So if something goes wrong, it'll uh, create an incident um, for quite a few of our processes. And there's probably more the team that's doing, but, uh, but that's at the high, high level. Uh, we also have a platform team that monitors uh, the system stability. So in terms of Blue Prism itself and you know, I mean, the other technology that we're using. Do you have any learning uh, Jesse here after hours that alerts um, uh, staff that are on call when an automation is at risk. We've been working on trying to figure out that logic uh, for about a week, maybe two weeks now and uh, are getting close, but we haven't uh, kind of broken that secret sauce yet. So <laughs> asking for a friend. Yeah. Oh, you're muted again, or I lost your audio. Yeah, sorry, I oh, cut there. off for a bit. Oh, no problem, yeah. Uh, can you repeat that question? I heard as sure. far as alerting yeah. after hours. Yeah, uh, yeah, one, one project we've got at AHS here is uh, building some uh, software um, that will uh, effectively look at the number of queue items in the queue, look at how long it typically takes, uh, figure out looking at our schedule, are we gonna, is this automation at risk? Um, and the intention is really to, to trigger that to uh, call our on-call staff. And I was wondering if you have any, any kind of capabilities around that to kind of phone home um, naturally, you know, the uh, paying staff to check the console or, uh, at night isn't super efficient, but that's one business problem I have. I would say other than the automated uh, ticketing that gets generated, no. And after hours and off hours is something that yeah, I mean, we do need to address, and that's part of the reason that we're really interested in some of the proactive monitoring capabilities mm -hmm. that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's a, that's a, you know, I mean, a bit of a gap for us at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, I'm just still going through some questions. I'm going to put up my, this is my last slide, so I'm just going to have it up there while we, uh, while we look at some of these questions, because I always prefer questions versus just, uh, presenting. So where did I leave out? Have you done any work with verifying app functionality after upgrades? Yes, I'm probably not the best person to be actually talking to, but we do have um, monthly patches uh, that go in. Uh, I believe a lot of the work around that has been, um, has been automated. Uh, so it goes usually pretty smoothly, but we, uh, we, we do have hiccups here and there with some of the patches for sure that we do need to pull a team together for after the fact. Um, but that's probably all I can say to that because after that gets a little more technical, but that's a lot of the work that our platform team does in conjunction with us. Okay, and then the question around OCR and AI in automation so far, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say at the beginning, the struggle was real uh, in terms of incorporating OCR machine learning with some of this technology. And um, it, it took a long time to be able to get to the point where we had, scientists 
Oh, can you still hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're back. Uh, we heard data scientists, yeah. Okay, perfect. I pause, I got a little thing saying your internet is unstable. So I pause when that happens now. Um, so we've, we have a great internal team that we work with that are really good partners and they built up uh, a computer vision OCR machine learning capability uh, mm -hmm. that we leverage. And we've been partnered with them for probably since 2018. So it's getting to the point now where we can actually uh, with their assistance, um, read new documents much faster than we were able to before. And there's always, you know I mean? There's always, depending on the type of information you're pulling, different levels of success, I would say. But I would say we've really gone a far away compared to where we were in terms of velocity. So how fast we can incorporate new documents as well as the success of those documents. Are you guys doing ICR as well as OCR? Um, ICR is the handwritten scanning. No, we're not doing ICR. Okay. Unless, yeah, we uh, unless somebody tells me otherwise on the call. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely want to, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what are we using for reporting? So combination, most of our reporting is actually uh, Tableau. So we pull the information to Tableau. We've got uh, Charles on our team who does a fantastic job of creating the views we need. Um, our stakeholders use it. We make it public to them. We use it. Um, so we don't push it to them. They just sign in and when they want to look at it, they can. And it does show um, our saved performance, volumes, trending data. You could uh, break it down by product family, you can go to individual queue. So there's a lot of capability in there. And then we also, um, he also pulls together some service now reporting so that we know incident turnaround, how fast we're jumping on the break fix, uh, volumes, um, successful change requests. Uh, so items like that. And no, we do not have staff on call 24 seven right now. The bots don't run overnight. So we kind of we kind of put them to bed at night and then they get started back up in the morning. And then let's see what Chris got here. In order to project additional capacity requirements. Yeah, okay, so one thing, and I'm answering Chris's question right now along um, needing more capacity for ongoing maintenance, that hit us as well. So, there, so there's two pieces here. So now when we have business cases come to us for automation, we, we incorporate an estimate in the line item for continued operational support. So we actually include it in the cost of the estimate so that we can reflect it in our ongoing operational budget to support that process. Uh, one thing right now, I think this year is gonna be a big shift for us in terms of capital versus operational budget. Um, we do have more in production now. So we, we do need to account for that. So there's two pieces to it. One, we wanna, we wanna get uh, more efficient at supporting what's in production. So that talks to some of the things we wanna do around um, scheduling and monitoring. And the other things I mentioned on the last slide, uh, but the other piece is, you know, I mean, understanding that our team's capacity uh, is shifting a little bit and we have to account for the operational piece. So, you know, I mean, one of the things we're working on right now is better transparency on how we are using our team members between capital and support. We do run DevOps, so it means our delivery teams are also doing support work in terms of break fix and stuff. And we are struggling in terms of nailing down the split right now in terms of what's actually happening. So I don't think I have a good answer other than, yeah, we're working on it and we incorporate it into our business case um, and predict the operational support that's going to be needed. Thanks for jumping in there, Natalie. Uh, Natalie uh, works with me <laughs> with the patch question. See if there's any other questions. If I'm missing one, uh, Jesse, please let me know. <laughs> I do have a quick question uh, pertaining to the service now. Um, so obviously, you guys use the APIs. Are you, um, you know, editing and creating incidents or service requests, or, or I guess in service now they're called requests. Um, what type of work are you doing 
are, are you looking at tickets and the, what the tickets are for and kind of completing them autonomously or? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of pieces with the service now. So one side of it is, is um, anyone can create a ticket if they see, if they see something's broken. So they'll generate a ticket and it goes to our ops team for triage. Uh, our, our own processes generate tickets. So it could also like self report that it's broken and it'll create a ticket. So if it stalls out or something. And then the other piece is, you know, I mean, with, with this technology, you always have exceptions. Some are planned, some are unplanned and the tickets get generated to, to go to, you know, I mean, a lot of the work we've done is with the back office that fulfills requests for the bank. Uh, so they'll go to their queues, they'll go to their appropriate queues. And this is largely um, account of some of the work they've done internally with ServiceNow. So, so that's a pretty cool functionality because the exception happens, it goes to the appropriate team to fulfill the work or resolve it. And they actually can now put together workload estimates in terms of what is the human workload associated with um, groups of processes versus the bots? So it's it's a good workflow ma workload management tool because they have visibility to the humans and the bots in terms of how much uh, how much work is being done. I don't know if that answers your question, Jesse. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, there's a question from Craig uh, pertaining to nearshoring the maintenance and monitoring of your uh, uh, digital workforce and critical processes um, over a 24-7 operation. I would say we haven't thought of that. And part of it is uh, because we are a bank, um, I think we're a little hesitant. hesitant with that in terms of monitoring what's happening with our with our functions. So I'm not saying we never will, but I would say we don't have the risk appetite right now to go down that path. Uh, Jacqueline was asking if the if it was possible to share any reports. Do you have any anonymized yeah. reporting? Yeah, cool, okay. Yeah, no, we can do that. Okay, technical debt remediation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this one's fun. I think this one has been the bane of the team's existence for a couple of years because, uh, you know, I mean, as the technical debt builds up and every, like, you know, I mean, the team is phenomenal, I would say. And um, everybody, everybody wants to produce excellent work. So as you learn over time, you kind of look back to builds from a couple of years ago or the standards have changed uh, or, you know, I mean, the process has changed and you're just seeing all the opportunity that you want to go back and fix. So it's hard carving out the capacity for that. Um, we're, we're trying to do it. So every time we do it, when we do an upgrade, we naturally address some of the technical builds, te some of the technical remediation. We're also doing, um, we're doing a big scan of the team right now to, to make sure we have all the technical debt uh, documented so that we could put a focused effort towards it. Um, Cause some of it really does impede uh, testing and remediation in the future. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Craig Nicholson, are you thinking of leveraging multiple automation tools such as looking at Microsoft Automate I would say not at the moment. We have evaluated over time um, different tools and oh, we lost our audio. And we wouldn't go to oh hey Anka, we lost uh, the last your response. Okay, I'll just say we 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 evaluate the tools that are available for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we we are not looking to expand right now on the execution function. So what, what the RPA piece would do, um, I, I'd say we typically look at more of the augmenting software for it. 
we're a, we're a Google shop, so we wouldn't look at Microsoft per se, um, but I would say we are kind of always scanning the uh, environment in terms of what adjacent uh, tools and software is available um, to what we do now. We have looked at process mining, um, specifically in the care center. So I would say the appetite is there. Um, we're limited in our capacity, so it's not, uh, it's not prioritized at the top right now. The, what I find interesting about process mining is that it naturally can lead to automated um, automation, right? So if you, if you get the process mining information and you've get, you have the workflow, um, we're at a point now where the technology is able to naturally uh, automate some of those wireframes. So I think one leads to the other. So there's appetite, but I would just say not in the near term horizon, something that we're going to take on. And I think Jesse, does that put us at time? I wasn't sure if this was 45 or an hour. Hello? Yeah, I think we're pretty darn close. Uh, apologies, I was just searching through the questions to see if there's any that weren't um, oh, perfect. Uh, weren't responded to. And I, I think we've got them all covered as far as I can gather quickly looking through. Um, yeah, the, I think this is awesome. Uh, one quick closing question is uh, um, just obviously COVID's impacting us all and I was interested in how it's kind of uh, you know impacted your team and the way that you manage your team and how, how things are kind of, how you found it to be impact uh, impactful on uh, at ATV. Yeah, I would say the, the impact was pretty significant even though we were a technology team. So, you know, I mean, we were a team that, was predominantly based in Calgary with um, some employees in Edmonton. Uh, we had a great location, downtown Calgary. Most people went in quite frequently. Uh -huh. um, the squads like to work together and like to see each other. Um, there was always flexibility. So nobody was forced to go in every day. So we always had that work from home capability. Um, the technology impact wasn't huge because it was literally, okay, just keep your laptops at home now. So we were already set up for virtual calls. You know I mean? We did, um, we always did virtual meetings with screens on and all that kind of stuff. So that wasn't the adaption, but it was the not seeing each other and not having those drive by conversations and not working together as a team, mm -hmm. unless you made a concentrated effort. Some squads didn't see outside of their own squad other team members for, for quite a while. So we had to make a concentrated effort to like establish those lines of communication. Like for me personally, I started having virtual coffees with everyone on the team. Because mm -hmm. otherwise there's some people I would never see unless it was in a big team meeting. Um, and I think all of the team did a little bit of that, but it it definitely is harder to stay connected, I would say. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Tons of interesting stuff. I've, I'm just been making making notes here in my in my uh, notepad. I'm like, I, there's so many different areas I gotta gotta I'm gonna I'm gonna take our lessons learned. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, yeah, have have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we look forward to the next presentation. Thanks for having me. Thank you.